Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another Port Moody Public Library book chat. It's summertime, and that means it is also summer reading club time. So not only do we have a great reading club for our kids, but we also have one for adults and teens, and we call it Spaceopoly. Now, here's my lovely game board, including some figures that you can decorate as well as a die to roll your way around our space Opoly board, which is definitely not a ripoff of the famous board game that starts with the letter M and also ends in Opoly. <laughs> so you can come into the library to pick up your space Opoly board whenever the library is open, uh, as well as download your own board to print at home if you'd like. Head over to programs and events on our website, portmoodylibrary.ca, and head to Adult and Teen Summer Reading Club. So today I'd like to introduce to you our panel who will be joining me to discuss some of our picks for tearjerker books, so get those tissues ready, and also biographies and memoirs. Say hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Tissue. Uh, okay. Good idea. Virginia is always prepared. Fiona is I have two boxes in this room, just in case. <laughs> all right, Corey, we'll have to use our sleeves, I guess. So it's all right. I'm five steps away from the bathroom. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> if you step out, we'll know. We'll know why. All right. So, well, with for, without further ado, why don't we get those tear triggers out of the way so we can cry our tears and then carry on with our day? <laughs> so with that, let's head to Virginia, who will share one of her tearjerker picks. All right. So my pick for this category um, is a book that I, I reread recently and, and still cry my head off. It will destroy you, make you ugly cry so many times. <laughs> it is A Monster Calls by Petra mm -hmm. Ness. This is a story, actually, the idea came from another British writer called um, Chiffon Dowd, but she wasn't able to finish the story. Um, she passed away in 2007. So Patrick Ness, who shared the same literary agent, um, took, the story, took the idea and wrote a story about it. Um, so this is a, a story of Connor. Um, he woke up one night and hearing someone calling him from outside in the window. And so he went and looked and there was this giant tree monster thing that was outside his window trying to get in. And Connor was like, what do you want, right? <laughs> and the monster was slightly taken aback, like, why are you not afraid of me? And Connor is like, I have seen scarier things than you. And he has, every night in his nightmare, things that are way more scarier than this tree thing. And the tree is like, well, you, you call me here. And Connor is like, no, I did not. Well, I'm here and I'm here to tell you three stories. And when I'm done, you're gonna tell me a story. And Connor said, I don't have time for your stupid stories. <laughs> and he doesn't because Connor is going through a lot in his life. His mother is really, really sick. Um, all the treatments that, he, that she's going through, nothing is working. Her father, his father remarried years ago and now lives in the States. So the only other relative that he has is his grandmother, whom he doesn't like at all. Especially when we, like, he knows what's coming. He knows the talk is gonna come, the talk of sort of what comes out of her. So he's having a lot of trouble sort of dealing with all of this. He's just a bottle of emotions, all the anger, the anxiety, the hopelessness, um, all of it just bottle up and he has nobody to talk to. His classmates, his teachers even, all the adults in his life, once they found out that his mother is sick, they don't know what to do with him. They don't know what to say to him. Like, sure, he, he catches the looks, like the looks that they give him, the kind of meaningless questions that they ask but nobody really wants to talk to him because they, they probably don't know how to. So this is a story of, of Connor going through this, this thing that happens to him. And now there's like this 
stupid tree thing that wants to talk, wants to tell him stories. Um, I would say this is, this is a book for young adults, um, but I don't think that matters anyone that has any experience going through anything like this will, will, will understand what Colin is going through. And, and I think Patrick Ness did a really good job because it's really hard to do a story about a deaf without being manipulative, like without just like being sentimental. But he did it in such a, a way that he's he's very economical with his writing. He's always been like, I, I really enjoy his his books. Um, and, and the way he just lay it out there, like raw emotions um, and and the way that he just makes you, you know, like feel all the things that that you would feel if you are caught as if you're kind of going through this, um, it's it's quite amazing. I I I ugly cry so badly this weekend when I reread this book, um, and uh, if I I don't have the book with me, I have a copy somewhere. I don't know where it is, but even if I have one, I probably can't even show it to you because it would be drenched like in tears still probably, because um, it was just like it was a it was a really really hard to read book, but at the same time, I think um, it's, it's one that you will appreciate um, in many different ways. So anyway, I'm going to stop now because I'm going to start again crying. So I will, um, Liz, get rid of my face from the screen. <laughs> okay. Okay, Virginia, thank you so much for sharing that with us. I was getting teared up um, listening to your description about the book as well. So uh, everybody who wants to pick up A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness, uh, you are forewarned. Um, also just wanted to note to everybody here that um, we will be putting up a list of all the books that we are talking about today at the end of the video. So um, don't worry, just sit back and enjoy. All right, Fiona, and it's cry, your turn. Cry along, cry along with us. <laughs> That's right, share in our emotion. Uh, Fiona, I understand you also have quite the tearjerker book for us today. Yeah, so um, my pick is The Island of Sea Women by Lisa C. Um, and I am not someone who like seeks out tearjerkers, but I like it when I find a book that's a good book and it happens to make me cry. Um, however, I do follow Lisa C pretty closely uh, and all of her books make me cry all the time so hard like usually through at least 50% of the book because they're just so tumultuous and horrible things happen to her wonderful uh, resilient characters. Um, so this book is uh, historical fiction although it does have uh, it does cross into present day uh, because it's such a long spanning novel. Um, it follows two women throughout their lives, um, Mija and Young Suk, um, who are Henyo um, from Jeju, Jeju Island. Uh, so they are part of a diving collective. Um, and uh, Young Suk comes from a respectable family. Uh, her mother is the head Henyo um, and Mija comes from a wealthy family with a very bad reputation. So her fa father was a collaborator. And uh, when her parents pass away, she is left to live with her aunt and uncle um, who are not very kind and they don't look after Mija. So um, by happenstance, Young Suk and Mija meet and Young Suk's family uh, pretty much takes Mija in despite her family's reputation and they become best friends and like sisters. Um, so it follows their friendship uh, through and rivalry throughout their whole life um, and that includes Japanese occupation, World War II and the Korean War. So um, I loved that this book um, made me feel a lot of genuine emotions, but it also was such a good learning experience. I had no idea how ignorant I was to um, occupation in Korea. Uh, it was really interesting to learn about the Henyo um, and these diving collectives and these families where women are, um, it, it's a very like matriarchal society where women are bringing in the majority of the, the wealth 
and uh, men stay at home and take care of the family. So it was neat um, to learn from that, learn about that. But I was just like blown away uh, about the like um, military history of Korea. I, you know, we spent a lot of time on World War II in school, but we like rarely look at um, the perspective of Asian countries. Um, and so I cried a lot from the emotions in the book, um, but some of my like biggest breakdowns um, came from just this, the horrendous uh, military violence. It was so upsetting. Um, and I made the mistake of listening to the audiobook, which is really, really good. Uh, the narrator is fantastic, but not being able to take it at your own pace or like I was, I was on the highway driving to work listening to like just the the most upsetting part of the whole book and like in tears you know like i have to start work in 20 minutes i can't turn off like my phone um and i miss my exit so it really um i think for you know like maybe a week and a half like sort of held this place in my life of just like deep deep sadness that would happen when I went into my car and started listening to the audiobook. Um, and I think that Liz um, uh, got some of the brunt of that because she was actually reading the book at the same time. So um, I appreciate that, Liz. Thank you for letting me cry in front of you about this book. Um, definitely recommend it for people who like Lisa C and people who, or, uh, who like historical fiction. Um, and also, yeah, I was, I really love, um, like multi-generational books, uh, about women, you know, it talks about her mom and her daughter, um, which is something that I'm a big fan of. Yeah. That's and, uh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Fiona. Um, and I do remember that day that you came in and I didn't know why you were so upset and you just said something like, Lisa C or C women. And I was like, oh, I understand they're there. It's a beautiful book. It's a great choice, Fiona. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And now for Corrine. Corrine, do you have a tearjerker for us today? I had a really hard time narrowing down what I was going to talk about because I essentially cry at every book. Um, <laughs> The, the tears, like, they flow freely all the time. Like, yeah, um, A Monster Calls, like, that was hard. Like, I could hardly breathe. I was crying so hard. And then I haven't read that one, but I did read The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane. And, yeah, ugly cry at that one, too. Ugly cry, ugly cry. Um, yeah, so I was kind of like, what, what do I choose? Because I cry at every single book I've ever read, pretty much. Um, I kind of thought maybe I could talk about The Authenticity Project, um, One and Only Ivan, Women of Silk. Like there's a bunch of books that for me were like the first time when I felt like a cry that was so cathartic, um, which I think is kind of like, I go after tearjerkers. I like books that make me feel big emotions. Like that That for me is like part of the reading experience, um, but it does make it hard because you have to read these books I find, and I don't know about the rest of you, like at very specific times in like the day or in my life. Like I don't want to read a tearjerker all the time. Like you kind of have to set aside like a weekend so that you do have time to feel those emotions and maybe not read it when you were commuting to work. Yeah, yeah, lesson learned. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I eventually kind of just went through my Goodreads and kind of just went back to the, the one that I most recently read that made me cry. I went back like a week, so it wasn't that hard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I ended up choosing the uh, middle grade book, uh, The Blackbird Girls by Anne Blankman. And it it starts on a, a spring morning in the town of Pripyat. And it's about two neighbors, Valentina Kaplan and Oksana Savchenko. And they wake up in the morning to go to school. And both of them are not looking forward to it for very different reasons. So Valentina doesn't want to go to school because for her, it means being careful and being quiet. And that is not who Valentina is. However, her family is Jewish. And so to fit into Soviet society, she needs to be careful and she needs to be quiet. 
And so she is not looking forward to that day because despite her being the model Soviet citizen, um, her classmates still bully her. They taunt her, they're suspicious of her, they say horrible anti-Semitic things to her, and the teachers essentially do nothing because anti-Semitism is approved by the state. And no one is more cruel to her than her neighbor um, and classmate, Oksana. And Oksana is not looking forward to going to school because the night before she had said the wrong thing to her father and um, he had uh, physically abused her. So she is uh, suffering from that abuse when she goes into school and has no one to talk about it, but kind of feels that weight of that she has done something wrong. She's always doing something wrong and that she deserves this. So they both get up that morning to go to school. And as they walk out of their building, they notice that the sky is red and that from the factory that their fathers both work at, there's this strange blue smoke coming out of it. And both of them realize that their fathers who work at this factory have not come home from their shift. So this is a story of desperate escapes and what comes after that. Um, it's a story of friendship and how that can kind of redeem a person in really dark times. Because the story of Valentina and Oksana starts with the explosion at Chernobyl. So both of their fathers work in the factory and both of them have very different experiences. Valentina's mother knows that something is wrong. Valentina's mother, because she is Jewish, because she is always looking for that, that other meaning under the surface of what the government is telling her, is ready. And so when the, they start evacuating people, when they start taking all the citizens saying, it's absolutely fine, all you're going to need to do is drink milk, eat cucumbers. And we're going to take you on these buses, we're just going to take everyone out for the moment, and we're going to take you to Kiev. Her mother knows that something bad has happened. And so Valentina's mother takes her and she also takes Oksana. Oksana's mother is convinced that her husband is at the hospital. And so she decides to leave her daughter to try and find what has happened to her husband. And so Oksana and Valentina are put on a bus to Kiev by themselves. When they get to the city, they temporarily are able to stay with one of her mother's friends, but over the illegal radio that her mother's friend has, stories are starting to leak out about what has happened at Chernobyl. And afraid of radiation poisoning, the girls and her mother are sent out on the streets. In a last desperate mother, a uh, last desperate moment, Valentina's mother puts them on a train to go visit her estranged grandmother in Leningrad. And so they're sent off into the unknown. The parallel story to this is the story of Rivka, who is a young Jewish girl living in a Ukrainian village, and it's World War II. And one night, after her mother has given birth that morning, she takes her daughters by the shoulders and she says, you need to put on your shoes, you need to get a backpack with some food, and you need to start walking. You need to leave. You need to walk as far and as fast as you can east, because the Germans are coming and I need to save your life. So she sends her off on this desperate journey. So it's, it's a story of survival. It's a story of kind of the redemption that friendship can bring. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. I would recommend it for people who enjoyed The War That Saved My Life um, by Kimberly Brubaker Bradley, or who really like Ruta Sapit's book, uh, Sapiti's books. Um, it's a fantastic story. It's written for middle grade, but I think it's really, um, really for everyone. That's great. Thank you so much, Corinne. It's um, it's wonderful to see that there's fiction out there that complements all the books about uh, Chernobyl and what the people in charge and the adults uh, were all doing. So it's it's fascinating to hear um, a story like that about other real human beings or human beings who are affected uh, by such a tragedy. Well, with that, uh, I have one more tearjerker for you all. So keep those tissues handy. 
Um, and it is called The Traveling Cat Chronicles by Hiro Arakawa. I've got a cover of that for you here. It was translated into English by Philip Gabriel, and he's one of the uh, primary translators for the works of Haruki Murakami, um, which I felt really lent itself to the story because um, there's a poeticism about the words without, um, without losing sight of what I feel the author was trying to convey. So in the Traveling Cat Chronicles, you can see I've got my own cat right here. So mm -hmm. I was definitely drawn in by the cover and also by the word cat in there. Um, we have a stray cat named Nana and she encounters a kind young man in his 20s named Satoru. And she sees him uh, as he goes to his car in the mornings to go to work. And when he comes back, she knows his comings and goings by whether his vehicle is there, but she keeps her distance. She is a very proud stray cat who doesn't need help from anybody. That is until the day that she is struck by a car. And because of her condition, she decides to let the kind man Satoru take care of her. So seeing his kindness that he has shown to her um, while also showing respect for her wildness as a uh, feral cat, she decides that after her leg is all healed that she will stay with Satoru and they will be a family together. So one day Satoru parks, uh, packs up his car and he says, Nana, we're going for a car ride. We're actually going on a little vacation. Okay, thanks, Nana. That's great. You get to see some more of Japan and see the countryside. So she's quite enjoying this ride in the car together with uh, Satoru. They stop at scenic points along the way. He lets her out of the car. Um, they see beautiful fields of flowers. They see the mountains and the countryside. Along the way, they also stop to see old friends of Satoru's. Now, when we say old friends, we mean going back years, um, like schoolmates that maybe he hasn't seen uh, very recently because they are further afield and he is living more in the city center. So he visits these old friends and they're different. Some are couples, some are single, some are farmers, one owns a bed and breakfast, um, and he reconnects with them and he talks with them. But with each visit, he makes it a point to introduce Nana. Nana, this is my friend so-and-so. Don't you think you would get along together well? This happens with every single visit. Um, so along the way, Nana's kind of thinking, oh, well, that's interesting. He's, Satoru's got a lot of friends here and they get to the house uh, that's the heir of the B&B. Um, and that couple, who are also school friends of Satoru, uh, they have a cat of their own as well as a dog. But through the story, we hear Nana's voice. Um, we hear her thoughts, rather. Um, and we can also hear the thoughts of the dog and the cat. Um, and, and so at that point, such, um, Nana starts to think, oh, I'm not sure why we're on such a prolonged trip. I'm not sure why Satoru isn't going back to work. And the pets are kind of going, hmm, I sense something is up. Maybe you should take a closer look at Satoru. Anyways, um, with all these visits to friends, um, nobody really clicks with Nana. Um, and so at the end of the visit, Nana gets packed up with Satoru and off in the car they go. Until they come to one final special person in Satoru's life's home. Um, I don't want to give things away. I think you can see where this is going. Um, it's a beautiful, sort of a love story, I'd say, in between a, a pet and a, a human um, about how, how the two different species can connect with each other, um, can be there for each other, and can have the best intentions for each other uh, and, and, and take care of one another. Um, so Satoru and, and Nana, they have quite the journey. Um, and Nana has quite her own journey 
as well overall. Um, so if, if things like uh, stories about animals um, really tug at your heartstrings, um, stories about relationships, friendships, uh, and family coming together, um, if those tug at your heartstrings, uh, then you'll likely be bawling your eyes out uh, as, as I was. And I don't normally reach for the tear jerkers. As I said, I was lured in by cat and cute cover. Um, but this one, this one really, really hit home for me. Um, and there was also a, a movie in Japanese uh, that I happened to uh, view on an airplane uh, last year um, after I had read the book. So even though I knew everything that had happened, so this is the, the film in the sun. I knew everything that was happening and about to happen. Um, I still bawled my eyes out on the airplane in front of everybody. So um, you are you are all forewarned. <laughs> all right, Corinne is Corinne doesn't like sad. I anymore. hate it. <laughs> yeah, you're not even a cat person, so. Anything with animals, and this is going to be weirdly specific, but animals being confused <laughs> makes me really sad. <laughs> makes me really sad. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the animals well taken care of, so on the bright side. Um, but yeah. <laughs> and with that, no. that concludes the... <laughs> That concludes the tearjerkers. Um, Corinne won't be reading that last one, but um, absolutely not. <laughs> but if anybody I else, of, yeah, if anyone else post that. Have a great time. No thanks. Net 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 net. I started I'm, crying on the first page of the one and only Ivan. The first page. <laughs> yeah, this is see. This is the great thing about having our panel for our Center Reading Club discussions because we each have diverse tastes. Some of us will read things, others won't. Um, so that's why we're all here. <laughs> okay, maybe we should move on away from tearjerkers, away from sad animal stories, sad family stories, um, sad people stories. Um, and let's talk about some biographies or memoirs. Are you sure these are not gonna be also sad? Yeah, I mean, usually I mean, they're bummers. I mean, no promises, <laughs> but we shall see. We'll have to keep going to find out. So with that, Virginia, I hear that you have yes. a very interesting tale for us. Do I? Yes, I do. <laughs> well, I, um, as people might know, I am not a biography or a memoir person, um, but I guess that's the good thing about Spaceopoly, Adelson Reading Club, is that you get to challenge yourself to read something that you would never read um, by choice. So um, so what I want to end up doing was I was like, okay, well, what kind of topics do I like to read about in fiction? And can I find something similar in like sort of real life biography and autobiography? So what I've got is um, Breaking Free, How I Escaped Polygamy, The FLDS Cult, and My Father, Warren Jeffs by Rachel Jeffs one of his daughter. Um, so I, I like books. I like dark books. I like cult serial killer. That was kind of where I was going for when I was trying to hunt down a biography. So this is the one I got. Um, Rachel Jeffs is one of 53 children from one of the 78 wives that Warren Jeffs has. Um, Warren Jeffs is the leader of F FLDS, the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And even though, of course, the, the church you may know is sort of based more in Utah, we do have a local connection because we have sort of a, a split branch of that right in BC, right in our backyard in Creston, BC, um, which uh, headed by the Blackmore family, which incidentally is um, one of them has become Rachel's husband once she got out of the cult. Um, so this book is her account of her life as a child being born into the polygamous cult until she left the cult in 2014 when she was about 34 years old. Um, so trigger warnings for all the horrible things in this book. Um, 
she, when she was a child, um, the first part I think was the hardest part to read because when she was a child, um, when she was about eight years old, um, the first time her father called her into the office and started to ask her to do things. And she couldn't understand what's going on because here is a man who has preached against all the things that he's asking her to do. And, and yet that's what she was told to do. And she's torn between the, I, I have to obey my father because that was, you were taught to like, you know, like, but I know all this is wrong. And every time she gets out of the situation, her father will say, well, Rachel, you did not pass the test. I was testing you. You're not supposed to do these things and you did it. So you did not pass the test. So she grew up thinking that she was, of course, a horrible person that is just like, and she just couldn't deal with it, right? Like, you know, and and so for years and years until she was married off. So of course she wasn't allowed to choose her own husband. Um, the, the prophet of the church chose your husband for you. And until she was married off in when she was about 16, like that was what happened to her, like, day in and day out. And she just, she just angry her father, but she doesn't know what to do. Um, but that was, that was sort of the beginning part. If you can get through that part, it doesn't get any better. Because after that, once she got married, she thought that part of her life is over. But that doesn't mean that her father is not continuing to control everything in her life, not just her, um, but her family and everybody that belongs to this cult. Um, even when her father her father has to go into hiding like all the time because he was actually on the fbi most wanted list um and so he's in hiding all the time and later on even when he was in jail um when they finally arrested him and he was waiting for his trial he he still managed to control everything that goes on in in the church and he would have because he him being the the prophet he's the only one who can communicate with god and their God will give him revelations. And so suddenly one day, well, you're no longer allowed to play music that is composed by outsiders. And suddenly it's like, okay, well, you're not allowed to eat corn anymore because corn is bad for you. Um, you can't cut your hair because that makes it impure. Um, or like, you know, now you can only wear clothes that are in pastel colors. And then to one point it's like, well, you can't hug your children anymore because that's bad. So like just, all sorts of random, ridiculous, weird revelations, especially during the time when he was in jail. It's almost like because he can do the things, suddenly he's making everybody suffer along with him. Not only are these like sort of public revelations that everybody has to follow, there's also these personal messages that, that get sent to people. So she constantly re re received these messages saying that, well, you are now no longer worthy to live where you are, so you have to move. So families are being torn apart by him um they will be sent to live in different places at one point rachel just given birth to her youngest son and he was not even one yet and she was told you have to go alone and live somewhere else and she has to leave leave her kids with and her baby with her sister wives like the other wives of, of her husband um and so after years and years of this, like this is just like constantly going on. And and I think what was scary about the whole thing is that when she finally got out, when you're reading how she got out, it's so easy in the sense that she basically just had to call her mother's family who has already kind of left the church. And she just gave her uncle a call and they just arranged a car to pick her up, well, sure, you have to do it in the middle of the night, um, you know, just so that nobody sees you. But it's not like she was locked in somewhere. Like, it's not like she was like physically restrained that she can't leave. But it's the, like the years and years of brainwashing that you went through that made her feel like she cannot leave, that everything that she does, like she has to obey the prophets. She has to obey her father. And it's that psychological, kind of like you know barriers like that is keeping her there until like when she finally sort of got out after 30 somewhat years of constant abuse and 
and all the trauma and tragedy that she has to go through. Um, so it was just, it, it, it was interesting when you're reading the book, it's, it's almost like, especially in the beginning of the book, it almost feels like it was, she was writing it in a very distant kind of way. She was just kind of like, it's almost like an outsider observing this happening and she's just like telling you what happened. Like, and I, I can't imagine like how you can write it other ways because once, I, I don't know how you can like, like, you know, write it, you know, feeling all the things again, because it, it would be horrible and terrifying. So it, it's it's interesting reading it um, and, and how almost straightforward that she made it, but you can tell that it's just like, that's kind of how almost like how she has to do it. Um, and listening, I, I got a chance to listen to a little bit of the audio book and she narrates the audio book. And it's almost, again, the same very like distant kind of voice that she was almost like telling someone else's story. Um, and it's it's just it's I I don't know I, I at one point I was like well I, I don't know if I can finish this because it's, it's just so so much you know to deal with but then I think I was thinking well like she wrote this book she went through all of this herself um, and and you know like and she has the courage to write it out like I think I can you know like I mean like just to, to kind of find out what what happened to her um, so yeah so I. It's it's uh it's interesting read um it's 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 from like if you're interested in so from a primary source of like what it's like to be in her case born into a cult and trying to get out of it um you know uh this would be a, a a good good read so this is breaking free how I escaped polygamy the FLDS church and my father Warren Jeffs by Rachel Jeffs thank you Virginia. I think um, I think what you said is so true. By because people have the courage to um, put their story down or to tell their story in some way, um, we help lift their voices up by listening to their stories and reading their stories and telling other people about their stories. So, um, which is why biography and memoir is is such a great genre, in my opinion. And going in a rabbit hole on the internet of finding out what happened to all of these people. And, Very and educational. The, and and in, in BC especially, just kind of like, you know, like all the connections with that. It's, yeah, so it's not just happening elsewhere. It's right here. So. Yeah, that's, that's pretty fascinating how, like you said, it's so close to home, some of these stories. Now, Fiona, is uh, your biography or memoir um, a bit more uplifting or less tear jerky? Yeah, she got out. out. It is uplifting. She got out. Okay. It's a happy yeah. ending. That's, I'd say, like, uh, it's definitely about, you know, having a difficult time and triumphing over that. And that's what I love about memoir and autobiography. Um, but, you know, maybe a little bit less heavy. So <laughs> I think I'm going to skip that one, Virginia, personally. Um, but I am a huge fan of graphic memoir, or sorry, of memoirs and autobiographies, but I'm especially a big fan of graphic memoirs. So the one I chose is uh, a comic book called Almost American Girl uh, by Robin Ha. Um, so like I said, love memoirs, but if they're in graphic form, even better. Um, Fun Home, Honor Girl, Blankets, El Defo, any of Lucy Kinsey's books are just, oh, I just love them. So good. And, um, oh, I forgot to show the picture. So this is the cover of the book and it is a graphic novel. <clears throat> I think it's, um, I think we have it shelved in adult graphic novel because uh, we don't have a YA section, so it's kind of together. I'd say, um, it's probably good for like junior high, sorry, not junior high, uh, like grades seven to uh, 12, but I, as an adult, I really, really loved it. Uh, so it is set in the 90s, um, and it is about comic book obsessed Chuna, uh, who lives in Korea with her single mom. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of, um, social norms that Chuna and her mom have to observe um, in Korea and being a single mom makes that 
difficult. Um, but I think Chuna really looks up to her mom and her strength and all of the hard work that she puts into uh, raising her, even though it is difficult uh, being a single parent. Uh, so in the beginning of the graphic novel, her mom tells her that they're going on a trip to the US to visit her mom's friend, Mr. Kim. Uh, but pretty soon after they arrive there, um, it turns out that her mom is actually there to uh, look at Mr. Kim as a potential husband and see whether or not their relationship could work. So without consulting her, um, Tuna's mom decides that they are going to move to America. They don't go back to get their stuff. They just stay. Um, and Tuna, who chooses the, uh, the name Robin, is kind of forced into this blended family. Um, and she feels like a total misfit. She doesn't get to um, say goodbye to her friends or pick up all of her comic books from home. Um, her stepsister's really mean to her. She struggles with English and um, everyone is making fun of her. And uh, so throughout in her early childhood, she deals with a culture shock, loneliness, bullying and isolation. Um, and then, you know, this kind of core relationship between her and her mom that has always been the most important relationship in her life starts to fall apart. Um, however, it is a story of triumph um, and uh, Robin really finds refuge in art and slowly starts to make friends and get better. Um, so it again follows her sort of like from childhood into early adulthood, which I really like books that have that length. Um, and it focuses a lot on her mother-daughter relationship and just the complexity of uh, looking up to your mom so much, but then um, being really hurt by her and frustrated that, like Robin's very frustrated that she doesn't have control in her own life. Uh, she's been dragged to America and she has no choice about it. Um, it talks a lot about belonging and um, how that can be really difficult as an immigrant. Uh, she's constantly pining to go back to Korea. Uh, and then when she does eventually go there, she finds she doesn't fit there. Um, and so sort of being in that in between. Um, I identified a lot with uh, Robin in terms of the um, obsession with comics and sort of being a little bit of a misfit as a kid. Um, but then it all had all of these extra complexities about um, just dealing with not knowing where home is. Um, and I really, it's so honest. Um, the author really kind of bears her soul in, in the story. Um, and I think that's, I really appreciate in memoir when, when someone is able to just like, just be completely honest. Um, and I think that uh, graphic novels are a great place to do that because you get the, the element of the writing, um, but then you also get to see how they picture their life. And it's, it's especially cool when it's, um, you know, it happens in the past. So you get to sort of like um, see what the 90s looked like. I was alive during the 90s, but you know, for this particular story. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'd recommend it to anybody who sort of um, struggled with identity as a kid. Um, and um, again, it really has these like female relationships uh, at the core, which is something that I love. Um, the author also has another graphic novel called Cook Korean. And it's actually like, um, it's a graphic novel, but it's a cookbook. I think I maybe talked about it before when we talked about cookbooks. Um, and I just love that as well. So I am following her to see what she does next because I just think she's an awesome writer and artist. Um, and I really love the book. That's great. Thank you so much, Fiona. I actually have a copy of that book. Um, mm -hmm at home right now. So I'm really excited to read it. And I didn't clue in that it's the same person that did cook Korean. So now yeah. I am extra excited because I really um, love her art style. So awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, Corinne, let's see what you've got for us in terms of biography and memoir today. Yeah, so like of the group, I know Fiona likes reading um, graphic novel, um, memoirs. I think Liz and I like to read a lot of biographies and memoirs. Yeah. And I think we all kind of are drawn to it for, for different reasons. Um, 
for myself, like it, it helps me kind of give context to historical events, like especially if they're written about the past, like it gives me a better snapshot of a time and a place and a mindset. Cause I often find like when you're studying history, that's the hardest thing to, to understand and wrap your brain around is that people thought so differently about things than they do now. Um, I don't know about you, Liz, what, what, what draws you towards the genre? Um, I really like um, sort of in general books that are kind of like slice of life. So it could be about um, the everyday, which to some people could be very mundane, but um, like you mentioned, it's about their mindset, it's their perspective, it's how they um, see the world. So I think that's, that's a huge draw of biography and memoir for me as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm really interested in history and some of the, the easiest ways to get into it are through someone's life. Um, and when I'm trying to understand a big topic, what really helps me is starting with children's books. Um, they often give you a really, really broad stroke understanding of like the big people, the big events, um, and then you can start doing more study, looking at adult books, looking at more specific biographies or memoirs. Um, that's kind of how I, as an adult, have started approaching subjects, because um, then I don't get too overwhelmed. It kind of gives you a really nice context for things. Um, so when I thought of like a biography or memoir that has really affected that thinking, that has really given me good historical context, good societal context, um, and really good understanding, I thought back to one that I have read a little bit recently, but it is a little bit older, but has recently come out again from Scholastic. And it is uh, Walter Dean Meyer's Malcolm X by any means necessary. And so this is by Walter Dean Myers, who is a lion of children's literature. Um, he wrote uh, children's literature and YA. Um, he was one of like a, a, a titan, a titan of writing. Um, and especially of, of black authors uh, who are writing for children and teens. He, he's just this, this luminous figure. Um, some of his fiction includes award-winning things like Monster or Sunrise Over Fallujah or Darius and Twig. So he has an extensive uh, backlist of fiction. And then he kind of went in and started doing some biographies um, of different, different people. And uh, this is the one that he did of Malcolm X. And I didn't have a lot of understanding. Like, I think that Malcolm X has really, in the narrative of civil rights, um, for some reason have, has been painted like a controversial figure in relationship to Martin Luther King. So when I approached it, I don't, I didn't know a lot about him. I didn't know a lot about his activism. And this really broke things down in a, a really understandable way. He kind of approaches it as going through his life in different important phases. So his childhood, um, where he he started as Malcolm Little, his uh, his parents being these intellectuals who are part of Marcus uh, Gravy, or I think I wrote that down in Baz Garvey's uh, circle. So understanding that particular movement at that time, and he does a really good explanation of explaining you know what the thinking was during that time and the critique of it that came afterwards um he talks about his adolescence and he talks about this pivotal moment in his life where he had grown up this this star student he was he was well liked by his 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 white classmates he was class president he had this bright future um and at 13 years old he wanted to be a lawyer and you know, everyone and everyone thought that he could do it, but his teacher took him aside and said, you are never going to become a lawyer because you are black. And that shattered his idea of who he was. And so he ended up moving to, to Boston and getting involved in kind of like petty crime because what, what hope is there for him then? he could work as hard as he could, he could have these dreams and aspirations. And he was told by someone, some authority figure that he trusted and appreciated that that's never gonna happen. So he ends up in jail where he uh, is influenced by the writings of Elijah Muhammad, who is another uh, big, big figure. And eventually once he is out of prison, becomes, transforms into this, this community leader, this, uh, this giant of, of intellectual thought, 
Um, it's it's such an engaging story. The way that he he writes it is just it almost reads so fast paced because you just want to know what what happens next. Um, what what is he going to do next? Um, what is what is he going to discover? Who is he going to inspire? And I think that it it really lays out uh, impartially um, and with great respect all the achievements um, that he that he did during his life. Um, it talks about different civil rights figures. It talks about different philosophies at the time. Um, it just gives you a really solid appreciation and background of who the person was and then the context that he was living in. I think it's a really, really excellent book for um, middle grade students. Um, I think it would be good for kind of like grade five up. As an adult, I found it a great base. So now after having read this and having that context for myself, um, I'm going to go on to the autobiography of Malcolm X and kind of get, as, as Virginia mentioned, like a primary source about this. Um, it just, once you kind of have that understanding, it just kind of leads you out to different paths that you can take to do more exploration. Um, if you uh, are interested in this book, I would also suggest checking out Dark Sky Rising by Henry Gates Jr. and uh, Stamped by Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Kendi. And there's also a picture book biography of uh, Malcolm X written by his daughter, which is called Malcolm Little. Um, and all of these are available at the library. That's wonderful. Thank you, Corrine. Definitely um, a story that uh, of the life that we should all be um, knowledgeable about because there's so many um, things that, that Dr. King was fighting for that we're still fighting for today. So um, great idea to use uh, children's books as primers to give us a really uh, broad, solid foundation for issues. Well, with that, um, I have one more book to share with everybody today. Um, kind of in the vein of what I usually read, if you've been um, watching some of our other videos and other book chats, um, I kind of do like the sort of darker, sadder stories. So um, I, I feel this the story that I will share with you today, though, I feel that it is also another um, very important uh, life um, that we should be aware of and what this um, person was pursuing in their life. So with that, this book is called A Woman Like Her uh, and it is the story behind the honor killing of a social media star. It was written by an investigative journalist named Sanam Mar. Now the uh, woman in question, uh, her name, at least online, her name was uh, Kondil Balok. And that was a stage name, so to speak, for somebody named Fuzia Azim. Uh, she was a Pakistani woman. And um, as mentioned in the title, uh, she was the victim of an honor killing uh, by her brother when she was only 26 years old. Now, she was picked up by the foreign press uh, and named as somebody who was the Pakistani Kim Kardashian. Um, and this this was quite a feat um, in Pakistani society uh, because social media at the time was uh, just emerging um, in high use. Um, people across the country were starting to be more and more connected online. Um, so at a different, um, different time uh, from the Western world, so to speak. Um, so social media was a whole new online world for the nation and more and more people were connecting not just with their computers but also their mobile phones um, so people would go on facebook um, on twitter and also instagram um, now kandil she she posted videos and and tweets about different things that maybe in our by our western standards um, are, aren't considered particularly risque um, but um, within the context of where she grew up and lived, um, she, she definitely was pushing the envelope and um, pushing a lot of people's buttons and very willingly. So um, I'm only partway through this book, um, but I feel that uh, the author has done a lot to, by interviewing individuals who had um, been friends with family, 
uh, or contacts like journalists um, with Condiel, um, as well as taking a look at her videos and interviews on talk shows and, and reading her tweets. Um, I feel that she she's really tried to capture uh, the essence um, of the person and not just the social media star, as well as her motivation and uh, her struggle of trying to push the envelope in a society um, where our um, the considerations for what maybe is moral or appropriate uh, would be different from other parts of the world. Um, so it's definitely been an eye opener in terms of um, cultural norms. I, I haven't read a lot about um, what society is like, particularly for women um, in places like Pakistan. Um, but I feel like uh, Sana Mer has really done a great job of not only attempting to show us what Condil's life was like in the media, but also providing that context. So um, showing how this is a society where there are talk show hosts who are female, there are um, models as well as actresses who are female and singing stars. Um, but that is not necessarily a um, career goal or a life goal even um, that is um, approved of by families. So Condale saying that she um, first wanted to grow up to be a singer and an actress was not um, encouraged as a child. And um, so it was very interesting to see how within society, once you've made it, um, and if you follow the rules of uh, how you're expected to behave and you can be that pop star, you can be that social media star. Um, but if you are trying to scrape your way uh, into the industry, um, then that's not necessarily approved. So it, to me anyways, I mean, um, from a Western perspective, from an outsider's perspective, um, it's been very interesting reading about these contradictions, um, but also learning about um, people's attitudes and um, I'm trying to be very careful with my words here. Um, so forgive me for that, but um, I, I can definitely see how she was, uh, there's a quote that says she was scorned in life, but uh, she was hailed as a feminist martyr in her death. And I feel like the, the underground movement um, to educate women, um, including about what to do if you are being harassed or bullied or blackmailed online, um, which the author touches on in this book, which is fascinating. Um, I feel like it's very interesting to see these undercurrents of change that are happening um, arguably towards a more Western um, standard, a feminist standard. Um, but it's highly interesting to see how, how these two worlds have been colliding um, and how public opinion has been mixed even within, within the country of Pakistan. Um, with regards to um, the so-called honor killing of Kandil. Hmm. I know I've got that one on hold, Liz. So if you could read a little Did bit faster. <laughs> yep. I am two thirds of the way through. So yeah. All right. It's been, All right, a, fine. It's been a page turner. Very, very, very mm. interesting. So I'd love to discuss it with you once you've had a chance to read it. <laughs> Perfect. We'll have to book club it. <laughs> yes. Stay tuned, everybody. You never know what we're going to be talking about. Well, with that, that is our last biography and memoir and also our last uh, book of the day for today's Summer Reading Club book chat. Thank you so much to everybody for joining us. Just going to post in our chat notes the titles of the books that we talked about today. So, if anybody wants to look back on those and the formatting is terrible, but um, please do check them out, place holds, and talk to us about what you thought of these books. Did you agree with us? Did you disagree? Do you have a better option for a tearjerker or a biography or memoir you'd like to share with us? Um, also, just want to mention that Summer Reading Club books um, website again, because we have linked to a lot of great book lists 
for these two categories as well as all of the other categories uh, which do correspond to all of the squares on our spaceopoly so tear jerkers is a spot as well as biography and memoir and we're Thank back you. next week right we are indeed back next week so through the summer we will be here on wednesdays at noon so stay tuned for our upcoming next two categories can I tell and this, you we were talking about it earlier of a book club. We should have like a, you know how people have copa? We could have a cry off. See who can cry first. Then we'll know which is the book that is like the saddest. I think it's going to be the Traveling Cat Chronicles because I was getting like <laughs> choked just as she's talking about it. And I didn't even tell you what happened. Like, not everyone is coming out of that book alive. Yeah. Like, come on. <laughs> Well, Virginia, I nominate you to leave the Tear Jerkers book club if that ever comes to fruition. I don't know if I can handle that. <laughs> I don't think anyone, any one of us can. We would just be crying our head off. That's the point of it, I guess, right? That's the point but of that. But if that's what the public wants, then maybe the public will get that. That's right. We'll just sit there and cry. Cry. It's good for us. Oh, that or, our feelings. <laughs> Or what's our, our next week's category, Fiona? Ooh, I'm so excited. <laughs> it is books by indigenous, uh, indigenous authors and books by Canadian authors. Yay! Who's going to be the host for that one? <laughs> yeah, we had a chat about CanCon on a previous video. Um, like I said, Fiona we all have really challenge. diverse tastes. <laughs> There's strong feelings about that category, yes. <laughs> Very diplomatic, strong feelings, as with all of our book chats. So with that, uh, we leave you today and hope to you enjoy your reads and we'll see you in another week for some more book chatting. Take care of me, bye for now. Bye. bye. bye.